Yeah, it's a done deal. And that's the most important thing to say here, Ian. Obviously, it's not formally announced yet by Liverpool uh, at the time of recording anyway. Benfica have released a statement overnight and it's confirming that the fee will be a guaranteed 75 million euros and then there will be add-ons to take this to a deal worth around 100 million euros. That's something we've reported for the last week or so. Um, the key thing here was that Liverpool and Benfica needed to arrange a structure of payments and exactly how the split would occur. It seems it's going to be 70 five million euros down payment and then the 25 in add-ons will comprise um, some individual related bonuses to Darwin Nunez's performance at Liverpool and then some team related bonuses as well um, contingent on how well Liverpool do with him in the side in the coming years um, and yeah they've got this done pretty swiftly and efficiently and managed to get a player that a lot of other clubs were in for as well but not necessarily at that price um, and it's a big moment too for the incoming sporting director Julian Ward who's overseen this deal Mike Gordon who's the sort of link to the ownership the ownership themselves uh, because they are financing this um, and I'm sure we'll go into the details because it could be balanced out that transfer fee by sales um, and then it comes down to the salary really and I think that's a key area of discussion too. Yeah, we'll definitely get into that. But Adam, just as the headline, what sort of a signing do you think this is for Liverpool and how much of a statement is it as well for the club to go out and spend so big so early in the transfer window? I think it's a statement because, you know, you were looking at them at the end of the season and all of a sudden, you know, there was doubts about Mo Salah's future, doubts about Mane's uh, future at the club as well. Obviously, Salah's committed, you know, to, to spend one more year there, uh, but he's not signed a new contract. Um, and Mane clearly wants to go. And I think Liverpool have known that for quite a few months, to be honest. I mean, they were framing it, you know, even in May as saying, oh, we'll have a discussion after the Champions League final. But, they, you know, the conversations I was having, they could sense that mood had changed. So they started planning, as good clubs should do. Um, mm. You know, you, you're planning, how are you going to sell him? Where are you going to sell him to? How much are we going to get? And, and what can we replace him with? And Darwin Nunes, you know, I can't, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I've seen lots of Portuguese league games um, because I've not, but he's, you know, had a huge impact in the Champions League last season, scoring at big clubs. Um, Liverpool obviously played against him twice in the Champions League. And he's someone that a lot of clubs were looking at, a lot of clubs of kind of all different levels. I mean, you had Newcastle and Everton looking at him at different stages, but you've also had Manchester United. Um, look very closely and Barcelona as well um, I think there's also a confidence about signing players from the Portuguese league you know when you look at the last few years someone like Bruno Fernandes, Ruben Diaz, Edison um, obviously Bernardo Silva came from Monaco but um, I think there is a trust you know that when you're buying players from the Portuguese league that it's going to go well. Yeah I do think this is the big test really for Liverpool, for Julian Ward as the incoming sporting director, because when they have committed a substantial outlay in the past Liverpool, we think of Virgil van Dijk, Alisson, who were proven. They were sort of game-changing signings. They were recruited to give Liverpool that final step to go on and win the major trophies like the Champions League and the Premier League. They were at an older age as well. Liverpool have changed their tack slightly with this one. They've gone for a younger player who's only had one season um, of really excelling in Portugal and did well in the Champions League. If you speak to people like we do around the game, they are intrigued by this one. I think that's a sort of polite way of putting it because um, they have some reservations about him technically, um, about his career so far. Um, about whether he is worth the money that Liverpool are going to be play, paying. Of course, when you spend a total package worth €100 million, Euros, you're going to have to play, start, prioritise, build around him. And that could see Liverpool uh, change their style somewhat. Um, perhaps, uh, you know, he being the focal point in a way that they've not had before. So what does that do to what has made them so successful to this point? Are we seeing the refresh that Adam's talking about with 
those three frontline strikers who are going into their 30s, who are out of contract in the summer of 2023. Is that the end for them? Is this the future? Um, and I'll bring it back to that point I mentioned on the salary. It's really crucial here. I don't think Liverpool are obsessed with um, making sure all of their transfer fees are to the liking of everybody. That can balance out. They probably will cover this through sales by and large when we're talking about Sadio Mane, Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain, Takumi Minamino and some others. What is essential here is the wage structure that needs to be respected for Liverpool to keep a harmonious camp and to remain sustainable. Paying Mo Salah in excess of £400,000 a week as he heads into his 30s is one thing. It's a much bigger question than paying Darwin Nunes. I don't know what it will be, but 80, 90, 100, 110,000 pounds a week. That slots in perfectly. And that is part, part of Liverpool's methodology going forward. Paying in excess of 400,000 pounds a week is not. And perhaps that's why we don't have an agreement on Salah as things stand. I think also, um, you know, he, Darwin Nunes was not the best striker on the market. <laughs> In this summer window, there was two that were, you know, broadly on the market: Erling Haaland and Kylian Mbappe. And Liverpool made inquiries about both of those players. Um, you know, they got in touch with Dortmund because, you know, if you're Jurgen Klopp and you've been at Dortmund previously, of course you're going to make that call and see what the situation is with Erling Haaland. And in the same way as they tested the water with Mbappe, and I think in both situations they came away from those conversations just thinking we can't go to that level from a salary point of view. Mm -hmm. So therefore, Liverpool's strategy is, what's the best of the rest and can we get that? And I think with Darwin Nunes, they're looking at potential, but also someone who they think is, is quite ready now. And also someone that, a bit like they did with Mane and Salah, that Jurgen Klopp can develop and, and really mould him into being a Liverpool player. Um, you know, he comes with a status, but he's not a superstar. Um, you know, he's still got something to prove. It wouldn't be... You know, like a Haaland going in straight away, you're like, okay, that's that's terrifying. I think with Nunes, it's a bit more wait and see. Um, but I think, you know, if you're those other clubs that are chasing Liverpool and Manchester City and you see them both sign, you know, proper number nines at the start of this window, you're worried. David, listing all these things and adding in the, the departure of Sadio Mane, which we expect to happen over the course of this window, it's quite a start, isn't it, for the new sporting director, Julian Ward? Yeah, it really is. And Julian Ward is very highly rated within the game and of Liverpool, of course, otherwise he wouldn't get this role. Um, but that doesn't make it any less of a test. And I think if he was expecting a, a quiet start, that obviously hasn't been the case. Um, Jurgen Klopp signing his new contract was probably brilliant news for Julian Ward, taking over from Michael Edwards, who had been in charge or at Liverpool at least for a decade and, and in you know, a real position of power in recent years. So when the news of Klopp's new deal came, um, you could forgive Ward for breathing a sigh of relief and thinking, well, that, that's great. He, he's the king here. And, um, and on we go into the future and I can gradually get my feet under the table. Well, uh, it, it's a rude awakening in a good sense in that form now, because this is a massive deal for him. And, you know, he knows the Portuguese market extremely well. Adam may be able to expand upon that. Um, but also... Um, this is a player that we're told that he absolutely loved. Uh, I think the big concern would have been about the price. And he would have had to debate that with Mike Gordon on behalf of the owners, who really is in charge of Liverpool on a day-to-day -day basis and is a key conduit. And, of course, Jurgen Klopp as the manager. Um, it's a big one for him as well, because there will be an expectation that he gets it right with this player. Um, it's a really interesting transition now because Michael Edwards, the outgoing sporting director, uh, is under contract, I think, until the end of August, the end of the transfer window. And then he'll head off into the sunset um, and it places great emphasis on uh, a man who was made his deputy um, in December, about a year and a half ago. Uh, so there was succession planning there that Adam talked about that other clubs are now trying to replicate with deputies, but are a little bit behind the curve, uh, unless you're saying Manchester City, uh, who are up there with Liverpool, of course. Um, and it's a really fascinating time. Liverpool are, are, are best in class. I think that's pretty well established. Uh, it, it's not so long ago that we were seeing stories about their um, 
transfer committee that was being derided in many quarters, but they turned it around pretty quickly and then they built gradually. Clubs like Manchester United will be hoping to do the same in the years ahead, but Liverpool are among a small number of clubs setting the standard. Adam, Julian Ward's a really interesting guy. He um, Previously at Liverpool, he was, he was the guy that was almost managing the loan uh, moves for the younger players and... Um, I think his job was kind of partnerships manager or loan partnerships manager. Um, mm. So as a result of that, in that role, you, you develop a lot of relationships with agents because you're dealing with a lot of young players, often from different parts of the world, and also helping to identify talent. Now, before that, he'd been at Manchester City, where he'd worked, I think, both in South America and Spain and Portugal. Um, and he'd also worked with the Portuguese national team. Um, I think it was when Carlos Quiroz was the Portugal manager. So you're looking at sort of 2010, 2011 kind of period. And at, and at that point, he was, he was in the backroom staff um, working on analysis and also going around Europe, sort of building up relationships with Portuguese players and their families and agents and things like that. And one of the things that happened at the time was probably half that Portugal squad was made up of uh, clients of George Mendes. So as a result, Julian Ward was able to develop a pretty good relationship with, um, with that agency, Gesti, uh, Gestifu, which is, sorry, Gestifute, um, mm -hmm. which um, George Mendes manages his stable of clients. And it's really paid dividends for Liverpool in recent years. When you look at players such as um, Fabinho that they've been able to do uh, through George Mendes. Who else, David, have they done through Mendes? Someone else. Oh, um... Jota. Jota. So Fabinho, they've done. Uh, Diogo Jota was definitely done between Julian Ward and George Mendes. Um, and then you've got this deal. And as far as I know, I think Darwin Nunes actually had different agents involved in the earlier stage of the process. Yeah. But George Mendes, as is so often the case, becomes involved not that long before a deal happens and helps to make it happen. And when you speak to everyone involved, they always just say, well, it's fine. He made it happen and we're quite comfortable with it. Um, he's obviously got a fantastic relationship with Benfica, um, George Mendes. And this, this was a deal where you needed, I think, to have those relationships in place. And it's sometimes, you know, sometimes when you go into a new role, you need that bit of luck that your contacts are the ones that matter in a deal. And actually for Julian Ward, that's what's happened here. And I would imagine as well that that January deal for Luis Diaz from Porto um, would also have had a link there where Julian would have known people from Porto and it would have been helpful. Yeah, I might just pick up on that. It was very interesting um, with George Mendes. So on this one, George Mendes has had the mandate from Benfica. He's not actually, to my knowledge, the player's agent, but he is working with the player's agent to get this done. On the Luis Diaz one, he had the mandate from Porto to... Um, conduct Luis Diaz's transfer to Tottenham. So that was maybe an agreement with Daniel Levy. When the players' representatives found out about this mandate, they weren't particularly pleased because I think George Mendes or his company had made advances in the past to try and represent Luis Diaz, which they didn't like. And so they found out about the Tottenham possibility um, and they didn't approve of it. This is when Liverpool, who were looking at bringing in Diaz in the summer, stepped up their interest uh, using those connections. Um, but George Mendes didn't actually do the deal because of that mandate to Tottenham. I think it was just done between Liverpool, mm. Julian Ward, Michael Edwards, Mike Gordon, um, the players' agents directly, and of course, Porto. So yeah, a bit of inside football knowledge there around the agents' world.